Good afternoon and welcome to a rather obviously titled segment in conversation with this segment specially designed to showcase the backstories, the journeys of individuals who have made an impact in their fields of expertise. Luminary Learning Solutions crafts this segment to offer you the advantage of drawing inspiration for your own personal journey. I'm Anton Thayalan, the Chief Evangelist and co-host this hour. I'm joined by our founder and destiny architect, Vidusha Nathavitarna, and together we will take you through an hour of free-flowing discussion. So for today's segment on In Conversation With, it is my privilege to introduce Steve Simpson. A little bit of background on Steve. He is an international speaker, an author and change agent based in Melbourne, Australia, who has helped companies understand strategically improve their workplace cultures for more than 30 years. Some of his clients include McLaren Automotive in the UK, Kmart Australia and New Zealand, Next Group in the UK, Goldfields in Africa and Australia, Barclays Bank in Africa and many more. Steve is also the author of two books, including UGRs, Cracking the Corporate Culture Code. He is the co-author to a further three books, the latest of which is A Culture Turned with his business partner, Steph Duplaces, whom we will have the pleasure of having a conversation with later this week. So Steve, welcome to the segment. Great to have you with us. Uh, it's a real treat to be with you, Anton and uh, Vidusha. Great to be with you. So let me let me kickstart this conversation, right? I'm, I've been fascinated ever since I had a chance to go through the profile. So a school teacher turned to an administrator in education to a consultant in customer service. And I know you've built a great reputation in customer service and culture was not always your thing. How did it start? I mean, what happened? Well, Anton, I'm impressed you've done your homework because that wasn't in the written profile that we gave you. So I'm very impressed. Um, yes, I was a school teacher a long time ago. I um, taught for around five years and then I um, went and uh, I mean, this is in the days prior to the internet. I actually, or, and I, I sometimes, I, I, I sometimes wonder myself, how did I achieve this? Because I went and I studied at the University of Alberta in Edmonton in Canada. And at the time I was, I was teaching in a country town in Western Australia. And so I, I actually got approved to do my master's degree, organized all my accommodation and payment for fees and all this sort of stuff by letters. I don't know if any of you, the um, people who are on this today understand what a letter is or even know what a letter is because that's the only way that I got to study at the University of Alberta. Um, it was a great year. I um, had a wonderful year studying there, came back and uh, spent five years in head office of the education department in Western Australia uh, where I met a gentleman I um, ended up going for a short time into partnership with and uh, we were doing research and training and one of the areas that I particularly was interested in was the whole area of customer service. Um, I don't know the extent to which you experienced this, but it, it is, it, it's baffled me for a long time about why businesses fail to give great service so often. And so that's what intrigued me. And I, I started working with companies and I could do some research. We do some customer research and stuff like that. And we try and train people up in the area of customer service. And um, it struck me soon after I began this that I was having an impact in some organisations, but having close to zero impact in other organisations. Now, I was doing similar thing with things with these businesses, but in one place we were having a big impact, in another, we weren't having much impact. So why was this the case? And it didn't take long to dawn on me that in fact it was the culture of these organisations that was determining the extent to which what I shared 
was picked up and run with in these particular businesses. So that led me down the path of culture. And to be honest, Anton, I do very little in the customer service space now because underneath that sits the vitally important aspect of workplace culture. So um, that's where most of my work has been over the past 30 years. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? I mean, because um, I was just about to, when you, when Anton was kind of introducing you, I was just about to ask that switch um, from customer service to culture shouldn't be too hard when you understand the kind of impact culture has on customer service. Um, I do want to veer out of it for a little bit uh, and come back into that core because I know that's very much your core. But I can't help but ask this because nine times out of ten, we do have a saying out here saying that the fish rots from the head. Um, and, and, and the same is true for culture. Um, and there's a massive impact um, that leaders have on the culture piece. Um, and nine times out of ten, culture, for better or for worse, especially in our part of the world, is almost synonymous with how a leader behaves. So if he behaves in a certain way, the culture picks up on it. The moment they change and somebody else comes in, the entire culture changes. Um, so is it the same universally? Because I know you've worked in multiple countries. Um, is, is that true across the globe? Uh, does leadership have the same impact on culture across? Um, Vidusha, I think your observation is a really good one. And I would say almost without exception, yes to that. Um, culture starts with leaders. Uh, there's a couple of distinctions I like to make though, which I think are vitally important. My view is that just because a leader is not creating a good culture does not mean that it's not possible to change. My personal belief is that most leaders are well intended. Uh, they simply don't know what to do to improve what they probably realise is not a very good culture. So in many cases, I think leaders feel bereft of any ideas about what to do. Um, but there's a second thing here which might be impacting on this, and that is what is the business case for culture? And I think a lot of consultants who work in the culture space have got a lot to answer for because I think too many people make the presumption that leaders know what the business case for culture is. And I think it's quite the reverse. I think many leaders think that culture is um, very soft, flowery values that we have written on the wall. And this is almost irrelevant to our um, bottom line profitability and our day to day operations. So I think um, it is incumbent on us to try and help leaders understand what the business case for culture is. Now, I'll give you an example of this. We did some research uh, with um, and this is with my great friend and business partner, Steph Duplessis, who's based in Africa, in um, South Africa. Uh, and um, you'll be talking with Steph very soon. Uh, who, by the way, will be able to integrate employee engagement to the culture stuff that I'm going to share with you today. So um, being able to see Steph, I think, is, is vital. But we, we did some research quite a while back and we stumbled across what I now think is a terrific question. It answers the question about what is the business case for culture. So in our research, we asked this question. If, if the culture of our workplace was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be on people's performance slash productivity? If the culture of our workplace was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be on people's performance slash productivity? Now, Vidusha, when I'm working pre-COVID, if I was working with a face-to-face -face with a leadership team, even since COVID, when I'm doing this via Zoom or Teams, I will ask leaders that question and I will say to them, I'll give you the outcomes from our research in a moment. But before I do, you as leaders put a percentage on this because in our research, we gave people a sliding scale that started at zero because, and zero is a legitimate answer. You might think the culture now 
realistically is as good as it's going to get. So zero is a legitimate answer. And then we gave people a sliding scale, zero, 10, 20, up to 100, and then 100% plus. I still remain staggered by the responses I get to that question. Because when we do it either via Zoom or Teams or pre-COVID when we did this face-to-face, -face, on average, when I put this question to leaders, on average, the percentage improvement that people would report would be 40%. That's four zero. 40% improvement. And I will say to leaders, are you serious? And they'll say yes. And then I will say, let's presume you're wildly over-optimistic. Let's halve that figure and make it 20%. Would you take it? Well, that's a silly question. Where else would you get performance improvement of that magnitude of 20% through what other program or initiative or technology could you ever get performance improvement of that magnitude? Now, once people, once leaders understand that connection, that there is a direct and significant relationship between the culture of our workplace and the performance of people, then we can get serious about it. And I think that is a huge gap that's overlooked by too many people. We've got to help leaders connect the dots, if you like, between having a great culture and a direct impact on performance and, and bottom line performance of the business. It's vital. No, absolutely. And, 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 and it's strange that you mention this because whenever we work with organization on the training and development space, we face up to the same challenge, which is most people think that when it comes to culture, there is a fuzzy area because A, nobody's quite defined what a good culture ought to be to begin with. If they have defined it through values, the values alone isn't enough. You haven't really mentioned how you would live the values. But culture also means that there is a huge amount of other elements that comes into play. So, so even so, when you write processes, two different cultures can write completely different processes um, and, and, and word it differently. When they write policies and procedures, the language that they use and the way they write it can be completely different, even though by and large what is mentioned there can be quite similar. But the way it comes across from an induction manual to their recruitment process to absolutely everything has a resonance to it. So culture is something quite all encompassing, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to pin and say this is culture. But at the same time, if you don't, you really don't have a start on it. So as much as you get leaders to buy into the business reasons for culture change, how do you kind of get people to understand what culture is in the first place? Because that in itself is a tough one. Well, um, I, I agree with you, Vidush. I think, again, you're raising a very good point. So the first, I think the first job is to help people understand the business case for this. And by the way, whatever initiative uh, is being proposed within any business, there needs to be a business case for this. Uh, so we've got to get serious about um, identifying what that business case is. But once we can tick that one off, then we need to get to the next issue. And that is, well, let's help people understand culture in simple and practical terms. When I first started working in the culture space, and like I'm going back 30 or more years now, um, I used to I used to, when I felt cheeky, I used to do this. I, I would say to leaders, culture is important, isn't it? And they would very knowingly nod. Yes, it's very important. And then I would say to people, so what does it mean? And that's when eyes would divert from me. People did not want, want me to make eye contact with them because they didn't want to be picked on to say, what does culture mean? And then this is where I became cheeky because I would say, well, I, I can make it easy for you because uh, Edgar Schein is widely recognized as the creator of the whole notion of workplace culture. Um, and his definition, I, this, this, is, this shows you how long ago it was. I used to have um, overhead slides. I don't know if any of your viewers today uh, have even know that they existed, but we used to have overhead slides where I had three pages worth of definition, which was the definition of 
uh, corporate culture that Edgar Schein first came up with. And I was being cheeky because this definition was so complex, so academic, so theoretical that it makes no sense whatsoever. And that's been, I think, a big problem with culture for a long time, that it's even if I'm committed to saying, yeah, I want to improve it, well, what does that actually mean? And so that's where I think we have made a breakthrough in creating the concept of UGRs, which is a concept I came up with around 30 years ago. UGRs, which stands for unwritten ground rules, unwritten ground rules, which we define as people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. That definition is vitally important. People's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. Some examples of UGRs or unwritten ground rules that I've come across in workplaces over the years include things like at our meetings, it isn't worth complaining because we know nothing will get done. Uh, the only time anyone gets spoken to by the boss is when something is wrong. Um, in a customer service context, we come across UGRs which say around here, the company talks a lot about customer service, but we know they don't really mean it, so we don't really have to worry about it, and so on. These drive people's behaviour, yet remarkably, they are seldom talked about openly. It's the UGRs, the unwritten ground rules, that are our culture. I say that culture is as simple to understand as that. Culture is simply people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. Um, so that's the next trick, if you like. What's the business case for culture? We've got to help people understand what that is. But then let's, people, let's help people gain clarity in practical terms about what culture actually means. And I will say to leaders and staff for that matter, it's simply people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. It's the UGRs, as simple to understand as that. Oh, that's fantastic. Because um, one of the things that um, has always interested me is, is the kind of seamlessness in which you can borrow concepts from home to work to a country at large, right? Because they're by and large, the concept of it and the principle of it remains the same. It's only the scale of things and the complexity of things that change. So unwritten ground rules is a fantastic way of um, looking at it. And actually, Anton and I spoke about this. And um, when we were doing research about unwritten ground rules, um, norms and, and things like that. But, but even though we talk about unwritten ground rules, nine times out of 10, um, the written ground rules and the unwritten ground rules actually clash, isn't it? Because we officially say one thing, on the other hand, there is the whole culture piece that comes into play and says, OK, but yeah, yeah, that's that's the official rule book, but this is actually how we do things around here. And when you walk into that space nine times out of ten, unless, of course, you're very, very senior and you can do something about it from an authority perspective, you're lost. So you have two choices. Um, one is to play along or be the odd man out. Um, how do you bring that into a level of consciousness inside an organization? Because it, as you said, nobody talks about it and that's why it's unwritten ground rules, isn't it? Um, how, how do you elevate that unwritten ground rule into something that people do talk about? Because nine times out of 10, once again, in our part of the culture, forget, forget organizations, forget organizations. Even in the family with just four or five people, we don't talk about them. Um, and you're simply expected to comply. Whether you liked it or not is almost irrelevant. Uh, it's just <laughs> the way we do things around here, right? Um, so how do you raise it? How, how do you get people to be comfortable enough to actually vocalize it? Well, um, I, I, to be honest with you, I haven't had the courage to address the UGRs in families. That's, that's, that's way too difficult for me. So, but you are right, Vidusha, because UGRs or unwritten grand rules are a function of human beings being together. This is not confined to work only. Anytime we get a group of people together, there will be UGRs. So they apply in families, they apply in sporting teams. And I think that's really quite intriguing how 
UGRs exist in sporting teams, they exist in social circles, in church groups. Any time we get a group of people together, there will be UGRs um, at play. And uh, again, you're right, they, they drive people's behaviour and it's very difficult to challenge them. And here's a good example of it. Um, a person who is new to a job, if they are lucky, they'll get an induction or orientation. And at that induction or orientation, they will get told, this is the way we do things around here. And then they go and find out the truth. And they find out by deduction, they will look for cues and clues to work out what the UGRs are. So I've got a theory, and I think this is pretty close to a 100% rule. My theory is this, a person who is new to a job, and by the way, this is irrespective of their level of seniority. I think this is, this applies, and it doesn't matter how senior the person is, right? A person who is new to a job will normally be quieter than they otherwise would. Now, I think that's pretty close to a 100% rule. So when I'm sharing this with people, I will say, why? Why are we quieter? And people will say, well, we're getting the lie of the land, we're finding out how things operate. And I will say, I agree. So let me paraphrase what you've just said. We stay quieter. Why? To find out what the UGRs are. Now, we don't have the term UGRs in our heads, but this is a function of being human beings. That's in fact what we're doing. So we stay quiet. Why? To find out what the UGRs are. Why? In order that we can conform. That's the power of UGRs. The vast majority of us, including senior leaders, will conform to the prevailing UGRs because it's too dangerous to challenge them. So the trick here, um, if you want to call it that, is to put this on the table. And so our work with companies involves a number of things, which I'm happy to talk about later, but uh, involves a number of things. One is introducing people to the notion of UGRs um, so that we now start to raise people's levels of consciousness about this. Because we've got a view, and that is this, that many people are subscribing to less than positive UGRs, but doing so unconsciously. Um, and if you stop and think about that, that's profound. Many people are subscribing, including leaders, are subscribing to less than positive UGRs, but doing so unconsciously. So we advocate we familiarise as many people as possible within a business about the concept of UGRs. And that of itself can often improve the culture. We can, we, I can talk more about other things that we can do, which are very important, but simply by familiarising people with the concept of UGRs, raising it to a level of consciousness, that alone can often improve the culture because once you learn about UGRs, once you know about it, I, I, I should preface all of the sessions that I run by giving a warning. And the warning should say, warning, there is no return. There is no going back. Because once you know about UGRs, there's no off switch. Um, and so you have to make a conscious choice. So the next time you're about to join in a conversation which is supporting a negative UGR, your brain will say, well, you'll, you'll know what you're doing and you'll have to make a conscious choice. Am I going to continue to do this or, or not? So that's the first step, actually getting people, as many people as possible, preferably everyone, familiar with the concept of UGRs. I, I think that's really important. And where from there, because see, the the challenge I think often is once you, and, and you're absolutely right, once you raise that level of consciousness, there is no off switch. You're conscious of the fact <laughs> that this is happening. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit like, it's a bit like smoking, isn't it? I, I, I swear, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of those things my dad used to smoke. I picked up the habit, not because of him, but, you know, for various other reasons. But but my dad was blissfully happy smoking because when he was, he they, they didn't associate smoking to cancer and dying. They really didn't. It was a social thing. Uh, believe it or not, he was given his first cigarette by his maths master after they have done O levels um, at 16. And, 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 he, and um, his maths master has walked up to him and said, you know, something to the effect of, now you're a big lad. Um, it's all right for you to have a smoke, right? Um, 
and given him his first cigarette and he's been smoking ever since from 16 mind you right so when i when i when i came of age and i learned about smoking and its adverse effects i used to tell my dad um, you know smoking causes cancer uh, smoking causes heart attacks and it just did not compute for him because he was not raised that way right so it was and and i and i guess being the son it's less of an impact he never went for a medical test to actually or spoke to a doctor about it either he gave it up eventually but when i picked up smoking i'm acutely conscious of the fact that there is a negative impact every time you smoke and which which dulls the whole thrill of smoking in the first place right I and mean, you can't have fun doing something that you're conscious that is killing you but you do it nonetheless right because because it's a habit and 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 it's Uh, I've lost you, Anton. Can you? Ah, oh, yeah, you're muted, I think, Anton. Sorry, uh, uh, Dusha, Dusha, uh, I'm on, on mute, yeah. I think. But go on. Sorry, I've lost. So you. that's OK. Is that OK? All right. So so in, in that sense, um, sometimes when you raise that level of consciousness, it jars you, but sometimes you just can't move out of it because you're ingrained to do so for years and years and years and years. And and in a way, um, you, you, you know, they say that ignorance is bliss, right? So sometimes when you don't know it, <laughs> at least at least you enjoy thinking that there's no harm in it. Now, all of a sudden, you're acutely conscious of it. But sometimes either because you lack the skill or because you lack the willpower, or because for various reasons, we still don't make that shift. And that can be quite annoying, um, especially when you're somewhere in the middle of the organization. You see your seniors um, not really changing. You're now conscious of it. And now comes that whole difficult jar that happens between these two powerhouses, right? Um, and that's a very, very serious thing to navigate. So when you talk about culture, uh, change comes into play in, in very different ways because the way you change culture is fundamentally different to how you would change anything else, isn't it? And, and it's a very difficult, long process. And most organizations expect that change to take place really fast. Now, of course, you can quit smoking like this as well, if you will it. But most people take a fair amount of time in doing so, how do you convince people that it does take a fair amount of time and a lot of work at that and that culture change isn't the same as changing your next Microsoft version? Yes, and I love your analogy about smoking. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's made me remember that in my final year of school, <laughs> this demonstrates how old and how long ago this was and how old I am. In our final year of school, we had a uh, fairly liberal, um, it was a liberal period, and um, we had the choice in our final year of school of uh, going into the smoking room and having a smoke. I mean, that's remarkable, isn't it? Um, but you're right. Um, once, there's, there's this fantastic book called The Knowing Doing Gap. So knowing stuff does not mean that you do it. Uh, but you, you again are right, Vidusha, in saying that being conscious of it raises the level of guilt about um, about sustaining the behavior that you know you shouldn't be probably sustaining. Um, and that's the ignorance is bliss, I think, um, message there. Um, so we've got a five step process for using UTRs as the vehicle to both understand and improve culture. And, and you're dead right. Just being conscious of the concept of UTRs um, isn't necessarily going to do it. I mean, it, it can improve things, but there's a lot more things that need to be done. So from a, so let's talk from a leader perspective to start off with, and we can come back to middle management or middle level, if you like, in a moment. But from a leader perspective, our argument is that the first step that is necessary um, is to um, paint, a, we call this the envision step. And this involves identifying and painting a picture of our aspirational culture. Now, behind this envision step, we've got a golden question. And I think this is, that sounds immodest, but I really think this is a valuable question that 
leadership teams need to ask themselves. The question is this, what are the key cultural attributes we need in place for us to truly be successful while making this a great place to work? Put more simply, the question is this, what does our culture need to look and feel like for us to truly be successful while making this a great place to work? Now, many companies have value statements. My fear is that the values are created with good intent, but don't sit as the foundation stone upon which everything else rests. Too many companies, I think, have the value statements out to the side, almost as nuisance value. So the, the question that I've just shared, I think reframes the whole notion of culture as being the foundation stone upon which everything sits. What does our culture need to look and feel like for us to truly be successful while making this a great place to work? Our argument is that this list should be no more than five or six, no more than that. And we can call this values if you want. And indeed, your, value, your current value statements might actually answer that question. If they do, that's great. Settle on those values. Um, but we need to gain clarity and commitment across the leadership team for that aspirational culture. We need as leaders to be fighting collectively and individually for that aspirational culture, not in the interests of being soft and flowery, but in the interests of us being truly successful while making this a great place to work. I say this, I say that there is a magnificent, exciting possibility for every company, and that is this, we can differentiate ourselves based on our culture. So few companies are able to do that. So we can set ourselves apart. We can truly differentiate ourselves from our culture, where we earn a reputation for having a magnificent culture. The moment that happens, you've got a queue of people who are wanting to join your business to be part of a productive, positive team. You see, my view is that to the extent that there are unhappy people in the workplace, the vast majority of them do not want it to be that way. Every, the vast majority of people, I was gonna say everyone, but not strictly everyone, the vast majority of people want to be part of a positive, productive, dynamic team where we are setting ourselves apart um, from su such a great culture. So the first step is to envision our aspirational culture. Then once we've agreed on that, we can find out what the current UTRs are. Now, um, that's where it gets really interesting. Um, shall I continue on this, Vidusha? Absolutely, go for it. I think it's okay. important, yes. So once we gain clarity about our aspirational culture, and that's a necessary first step, we can then find out what the current UTRs are. And to share this, I need to take you back uh, more than 20 years ago when two Australian universities got involved in doing world first research into UGRs. Through that research, we discovered a way to find out what the current UGRs are. And this is so simple, it's incredible, but it's so powerful, it's unbelievable. Because in our research, we got people anonymously to complete the sentence to what we now call lead in sentences, lead in sentences. So for example, in our world first research, we got people anonymously to complete this sentence. Around here, customers are. Now, would either of you guys like to guess some of the responses we got to that? Around here, customers are. <laughs> would you like to predict? Taken for a ride is not important. <laughs> Just a way of making money. <laughs> You've been reading my notes because we, we literally got those words. Um, now, we were gobsmacked because each of these five companies that got, were involved in this world first research, each of these five companies had wonderful documentation proclaiming their commitment to customer service. What a load of rubbish if they are the prevailing UGRs. Vidusha, we literally had one person write, around here customers are an interruption to my working day. I kid you not, we literally <laughs> had one person say that. Wow. Another, another person wrote around here, customers are a pain in the, 
Uh, well, actually, I'll, I need to censor this a little bit. <laughs> uh, customers are a pain in the neck. They didn't say neck. They said something worse than that. But we literally had those words. Now, if we've got a competition, if we've got a clash between the words that are written down about our customers and the UGRs, which will win? I mean, it's a stupid question. It's the UGRs that will win every single occasion because the UGRs are the way we do things around here. So we realised through that world first research that we had unearthed an extraordinarily powerful method of unearthing the prevailing UGRs. So we've got a bit smarter in the 20 years that have gone by. What we do now is we say, well, let's use our values or our aspirational culture as the um, as, as the points where we try and find out what the UTRs are. So I'll give you an example. Many companies have the word respect as a value. Let's just say respect was an, ascent, was an essential cultural attribute that we were fighting for. I wonder how your people would complete this sentence if respect was one of your values. Around here, people are treated. I wonder how your people would complete that sentence. Well, we've done that with many organisations and I can tell you it is amazingly revealing when we read the responses that people give. Just imagine that teamwork or cross-departmental relationships is a cultural attribute or value that we're fighting for. I wonder how your people would complete this sentence around here when it comes to dealing with people from other work areas. Uh, just imagine that innovation, um, constant improvement is a value that we're fighting for. I wonder how your people would complete this sentence around here when someone comes up with a new idea. So when we do this, um, we link our lead in sentences to the culture that we're fighting for, which often is the values. And we have no more than 10, 12 maximum lead in sentences. And this is what we do with organisations. And um, some of the stories I can tell you about some of the responses are amazing. Um, and this is surfacing the current UGRs. We are capturing people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. It is very often very confronting for leaders, um, but without knowing this, uh, we're ignorant to the current UGRs. So it is tough for leaders. It takes courage to go down this path. But our question is, so what's the alternative? What is the alternative here? Um, so that's what McLaren Automotive in the UK over four years, uh, all the organisations that Anton mentioned that we've worked with, um, we do what's called a UGRs stock take, like an inventory where we're finding out what the current UGRs are, not, not just random, linked to those most important aspects of our culture that are necessary for our future success while making this a great place to work. And it's a revelation. Right, just just stepping in for, for the benefit of our organ, um, audience. We are in conversation with Steve Simpson. And, and here is a bit of a fun fact. The peak body of professional conference speakers in Australia and Professional Speakers Australia recognized Steve's achievements by awarding him the prestigious Australian Educator of the Year Award, one of only 10 ever awarded. Well, on that note, thank you for, for giving us a bit of an insight. It was almost like I was thinking of a question and Steve, you were you were you're picking them up off straight off my mind. But you mentioned McLaren's and I'm, I'm kind of want you to go in a little bit deeper because one of the questions I had was I know I, I know Vidushi used the analogy of smokers and I understand that it is possible for organization to transform I mean it's never a case of it's too late now but having said that um, it is it is a painful Right, it is one that requires a lot of patience and, and consistency, right? And and you mentioned and you touched upon a few of these, but can I ask you to specifically give us a couple of examples of the characteristics of companies that are able to actually transform their cultures, um, i.e. 
you know, where you said people are ignorant of their UGRs, but clearly you were able to sort of bring them to light, make them see that, and also to see the kind of UGR that they really need to be having in practice. But what are some of those characteristics? Maybe with some examples, if, if that's possible. Anton, it's really interesting that you asked that question because that is, that is the essence of a question that the executive team at McLaren asked me. So we work with McLaren Automotive. Many of you will know that um, McLaren have a Formula One team. I'm not working with that division. We're working with the automotive division, the division that makes road cars. Um, it is the most remarkable premises I have ever seen. Their premises are in Woking in Surrey in England. It is, it is amazing, their premises. And um, their vehicles are just gobsmacking vehicles. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Um, so I've, I'm now a convert, I'm converted into a car buff. And every time I see a McLaren, which isn't that often, um, I say to myself, I've been there. I've been where the, they made your car. Um, but so we did over four years, we did uh, UGR stock take with them because th this is this is the brilliance of McLaren. Not only did they want to differentiate themselves based on their vehicles, which are truly profound. I mean, they're comp they're, this is a supercar. They're competitors of Ferrari and Lamborghini. Uh, but they also wanted to differentiate themselves based on their culture. Now, is that brilliant or what? Um, so um, in, I, it was the second or third year that we were working with them. The CEO said, Steve, in addition to sharing the results from the stock take, could you also tell us what it is that differentiates companies that are truly able to transform their cultures? And so I sat with the executive team around a board table and I um, began this session with them by saying this. I said to them, I think I'm about to disappoint you because I think what you're asking me for are what strategies and tactics do companies deploy that enable, to, that enable them to truly transform their cultures. And I'm not going to answer that question because I'm going to give you three principles that characterize companies that are genuinely able to transform their, company, their cultures. You see, if we try and pick up a strategy or tactic, it might work in this company, but it's not going to work in ours. So they are not necessarily transfer, transferable, but principles are. So I share with them these, three principles. The first one was, um, this is, well, I'll, I'll share quick, three quick stories that focus in on each of my principles. The first story is this. I was working with an engineering company and they loved UGRs. So I was going to meet with them at their premises a month after we did our first sessions. And as soon as I arrived at their premises, one of the leaders grabbed me and said, Steve, quick, um, come and have a look at this. So he took me into his office, pulled up his computer screen, and he showed me this very sophisticated um, critical path method software, which showed all of their, their culture improvement projects mapped out into all these projects. And it was at that point, what I was thinking and what I said were two different things, because what I was thinking, what I couldn't say was this. Uh, what I was thinking was, you actually don't get it. You really don't get it. Because if you think that culture is simply the sum total of improvement projects, then you don't get culture. Culture is less about projects and more about the way we do things minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week. So principle number one is that this is less about being a project and more about how we actually function as leaders and staff for that matter. Principle number one. Principle two, I'm working with another company and they loved UGRs. We did UGRs for the whole day with their people. And then I'm working with the leaders and I asked them this question. So the leaders are in the room and I asked them this question. I said, if I went to your people, so I'm talking to the leaders now, if I went to your people and asked them, what are your leaders' top three priorities? So leaders, you're not in the room, but I'm speaking to your people. Now we're talking about you. What are your leaders' top three priorities? What would they say? Well, this group of leaders, there was a stunned silence. And the first one to speak up said this, to his credit, he said, Steve, we don't even know what our top three priorities are, so how would they? 
So my point is this. Do we want culture to be a top three priority? You don't go to jail for it not. But you're either serious about this or you're not. So principle number two is, are we deadly serious about culture as a top three priority for our business? Because unless it is, then this isn't going to go anywhere. And we can talk about it. But you know what? You probably shouldn't talk about it either because people will know very quickly that this isn't a priority. So principle one is this is less about being a project, more about the way we work day by day. The second principle is this is must be a top three priority. And the third principle, I'll tell you another story. I'm working with a great leader. Her name is Doris. And I said, um, have we succeeded with our work on UGR? She said, Steve, we've got it beaten. I said, what are you talking about, Doris? She said, I heard this story secondhand. I wasn't even in the premises. And the story goes like this. There are two staff in the office. One staff, staff member pulls out the drawer on the filing cabinet. And one of the files in the suspension files has a label on it. And the label says management guff. Now, I don't know if that translates for you guys, but guff, if it doesn't translate, guff means rubbish. So the label is actually saying management rubbish. And the other staff member seeing this says, do you think that's the right thing to do given our work on UTRs? The first person who's pulled the drawer out says, you're right, I'm going to change it. So what's my point here in principle number three? This is about shared ownership. And if we can get staff fighting for a more positive culture, that is the day that we have really made significant pro progress. So the three principles are this. This is less about being a project, more about how we behave ourselves. Secondly, it must be a top three priority of leaders. And thirdly, this is about shared ownership. I think too many staff take a cop out position. And that is this. If only they fix things up, we'd be OK. That might partly be true, but it will not be 100 percent true, because once you know about UGRs, you know that all of us contribute to the prevailing UGRs. Staff have a part to play here as well. And it's enough. let's have enough of the cop out position. Let's take start taking some personal responsibility and accountability. Wrong answer, Anton. Sorry about that. No, no, that's fine. I think that's that's absolutely essential. And I love it because and I'm going to kind of move into the last point you made, because that's one thing I always wanted to make sure that people do understand, because even though, yes, leaders have a massive impact on culture, whether we do something about it or not, I think is very much a shared ownership. It cannot be done by leaders alone. Um, and this is the same problem we have as a nation sometimes, where we expect our leaders to do all the work and, and, and pave the way when we don't take onus and ownership of the little things that we can do that makes it better on a day by day basis. And that makes a huge difference over a period of time. Little things done right over a long period of time has massive impact. But on that note, how do you make sure that people who doesn't who, who don't necessarily have the authority to understand that they also contribute very, very, very significantly to a culture. They don't have the authority. And that's the cop out, isn't it? I can't do anything much. I am not empowered to do so. I don't have the authority. I am too junior. All of these are very, very normal sentences that come out. How do you address that group of people? So, you know, um, sometimes I will have um, people who are leaders of smaller teams say to me, do we need to get the whole organization on board for us to have any impact on this? And my answer will always be the same. That is my preference. But if that's not possible, then let's focus on those aspects over which we have influence or control. So my argument will always be that if we can't get the whole of the organization involved, let's focus in on, on the smaller teams. And smaller teams can do a UGR stock take. We can familiarize everyone with the concept of UGRs. Um, once we do a UGR stock take, and this is where we can get everyone involved, we can share the results, including the words that people have written to complete the sentence, 
to each of the lead in sentences. And we can identify what are the major messages across those words. And then we can get to a very important, vital aspect, which is, so what can we do to make improvements to this? Let's identify some areas of concern from our stock take. Let's also identify some successes that we can celebrate, but let's also identify some opportunities for improvement. What can we as individuals and collectively do to make a difference here? So this is where we can help one another. And I always argue for successful culture, successful culture change, two ingredients are necessary. We need to support and challenge one another. Support and challenge. And this applies to leaders in as much as it does to any individual in teams. We must support and challenge one another. So uh, in identifying opportunities for improvement, we must arrive at things that we as individuals can do differently. And we can support and challenge one another around that very point. What can we as individuals do differently to make this better? And this, this helps harness the shared ownership, but it also helps um, harness the individual ownership of this. Um, when I was a, a young man, I took a year off school. So after I finished my schooling and prior to going to university, I took a year off and um, I worked for a large part of that year in a furniture removal company. So a person who was shifting house, they would hire this company in that I was working with and we will put their, their furniture into a truck drive it to their new house and offload their furniture. So I carted furniture, including pianos and stuff like that. So it was hard work. I was at that, at that workplace. I was literally told these words, slow down, boy, you're moving too fast. As an 18 year old, slow down, boy, you're moving too fast. So too often the prevailing UGRs are used to drag down people to bring them back. So my hope, my dream, is that we can flip this and do quite the reverse, where we can pull people forward. So, and this has happened in many organisations that I've worked with. So Kmart, for example, in Australia and New Zealand, is, a, is now Australia's leading retailer, over 200 stores. This is a discount department store, over 200 stores across Australia and New Zealand over 100 staff in each of the stores. They used to have an awful toxic culture. They used UGRs as the vehicle to understand and improve their culture, and it flipped. It, it flipped 180 degrees to the point where I know this is a fact. A person who was new to a team would come into a store. And if they started talking negatively about customers, the customers were a pain in the neck or whatever, they'd get pulled in the line, the reverse of what happened to me. They'd say, hang on, and the staff would do this. No, we don't talk about customers that way. Customers, we value customers here. That's not the way we do things around here. So, you know, what, once that happens, try and stop it. You know, we can gain such momentum. Remember, the vast majority of people who are unhappy in the workplace do not want it to be that way. They want to be part of a dynamic, positive, productive team. And that gets truly exciting um, and, and can get everyone involved. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. I'm, I'm very conscious of time and um, um, Anton always has to drop me a text saying, you know what, it's time to shut up because I, I ramble along um, um, and I completely lose track of time every single time. But but uh, I, I I just want to ask one last question because ever since you started talking, it's it's been nagging me and I think I should ask it now. Um, you know, most of the time we, we, we have this notion of culture, changing cultures and things like that. As And you've answered this partly by saying they're not necessarily projects, they're not necessarily initiatives, they're changing the way we fundamentally behave and also being conscious of the fact that there are things that we do unconsciously that propagate this behavior, that unless we consciously do make a change, the culture doesn't go anywhere, it remains exactly as it is. But that's what you do, it's not who you are. Um, but sometimes what you do actually changes who you are. So how has, you know, working on this piece on culture and change changed you as a person? Has it? Wow. 
that's that's a good question. That's a really good question, um, and one that I've honestly not reflected on. Um, look, um, I, I think through my work with Steph, who is a great man, and for those of you who are, who are still with us right now, uh, who are contemplating whether or not to join up to Steph's uh, conversation, which is going to happen in the next week or so, I strongly recommend that you do because. Uh, Steph is a truly remarkable man um, and we've worked together for 20 years now and I think um, we, we live UGRs in our relationship and um, and that's been successful. I mean, in essence, and you'd know this, um, uh, Vidusha, that sustaining a business relationship is a bit like a, a marriage, uh, especially when it's 20 years. Um, and we've, we've, I think, um, constantly been characterized as being transparent. I've learned this off Steph as well. Transparency is key. Uh, care for um, how the other one feels about given contexts is essential. Um, um, almost to the point where um, almost to the point where I, he, I get concerned that Steph on occasions might be giving too much away. That's how much he cares. So that that fosters that exact same characteristic in me. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's always a work in progress. Um, but we don't argue. We don't. Um, we have different views, but yeah, you know, yeah, I I I think. That's been instructive um, for the 20 years that we've known each other. So I'd highly recommend tune in for Steph. If if this session has been less than satisfying today, I can guarantee Steph's won't be because he he's got the engagement part um, covered. So he'll talk about how can we uh, get employee engagement to complement the culture change that we're fighting for, and uh, he's got some expert and unique views about that. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very, very much. Um, I am conscious of time and um, I will keep quiet because otherwise, even though Anton is in Colombo and I'm in Candy, he's just going to maul me. So with that, thank you very much. It's a space that I love. Um, it's 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 one of the pieces of work that I personally do and have done over the years that brings me a great amount of satisfaction. I'm nowhere close to what the kind of work you do, but um, in a previous life, culture change was big on the agenda for me um, uh, uh, as a member of the senior management team. And, and it's one of the things I struggled with. And I wish back then we had people like you who made it simpler for us because we complicated the hell out of it um, before we eventually figured out it is actually down to behavior and not projects. So thank you very, very much for that. And I'm absolutely sure that very many who are listening in right now will greatly benefit from this because culture change, I think, is top on the agenda for most of the people that we speak with and work with, but they don't necessarily have the ability to go through with it in a structured, clear, focused and simple manner the way you presented it. So thank you very much. And hopefully some of them will reach out to you and Steph um, to do some of those pieces of work. So with that, thank you very, very much. Um, thank you very much for accepting the invitation on short notice. I'll pass you back to Anton. Thanks, Padusha. I really appreciate it. And by the way, if any people who are with us now would like a, um, a, a booklet, a PDF booklet on the five steps, because I've, I haven't spoken to all of the five steps yet today, um, you, sh you should feel free to email me, steve at ugrs.net, and I'd be more than happy to uh, send you that booklet out, uh, steve at ugrs.net. And thanks for your kind words, Fiducia. I really appreciate it. Steve, thank you very, very much. Not quite sure what else I can say to what Vidushi just brought out. Thank you for carving out a moment in time. It has been an interesting, honestly, an interesting and a thrilling ride. What stories, what inspiration uh, and, and the whole whole angle to UGR. And I know we will we will get to work with you on this very soon. Next week, we are in conversation with Steve's business partner, Steph Duplacy,
from South Africa, and we will dive into employee engagement and a bit more on UGR. So do watch our social media spaces for the links to join in. If you've missed a part of this conversation, it will be up on our YouTube channel. So do visit, do subscribe, and do hit that notification button to stay updated and remember to share. So with this, I bid you a wonderful rest of the day. Stay safe, stay productive.